Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to This Week in Indies for October 31st, 2021. The easiest date to remember because it's Halloween in uh, pretty much everywhere, I think. I, I don't know if there's, there are probably places that don't celebrate it. I don't know. But uh, uh, it's Halloween here in the States and it's in Canada and uh, I guess North America, we can say. But uh, welcome to the show. we got a great one for you. And uh, we, we're going to be talking, we're going to get a little dark today and talk a little bit about um, writing writing with kind of this dark idea and uh, wrestling with it and, and dealing with it and all of that fun stuff on the round table. Uh, first and foremost, though, um, if you didn't know, the, the launch has ha happened at midnight uh, earlier uh, in this day. Uh, but our friends over at the Speculative Fiction Academy have launched their academy. And uh, I have a class there. And uh, if you want to go check it out, I'm, I did a screenwriting course. Um, it's a 10-week course. And uh, it, it's an immersive about screenwriting. And so uh, more about them here. We'll play a little bit, uh, a little teaser for them. And then we'll be back at the round table. So enjoy that. And we'll be right back. Like vampires and ghouls? Superheroes and androids? Want to learn how to write them? The Speculative Fiction Academy is perfect for you. With five curriculum tracks and three ways to learn, you'll go beyond the fundamentals to hone your craft. Visit speculativefictionacademy.com to learn more. All right. So go check that out. Uh, the link is in our description, as all of the links are. And uh, we're here with the round table. And um, we'll bring everybody on board here. And hey, there you go. See, now we can see it, Amy. It works now. Wonderful. <laughs> awesome. We were having some technical difficulties on the other end, but. Uh, Looks like everything's all good, and uh, welcome to the show, everybody. And uh, you know, you know the drill, everybody. So let's just run around and uh, have everybody introduce themselves. So we'll, I'll just go down the line here. So Nikki, start us off, please. Hi, I'm Nikki Nelson Hicks. I'm a writer of speculative fiction and horror, and pretty much whatever else you uh, give me a, a contract to write um, to celebrate the spooky season. I would pretty much push the perverse muse. Mm -hmm. It basically asks the question, not so much how did Edgar Allan Poe die, but who killed all the women in his life? And a particular uh, historian has the, the answer to that. So that's pretty much what I do. Perfect for our conversation today. <laughs> oh, I'm all about the dark. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Anita? Um, hi, I'm Anita Stewart. I write under AF Stewart, horror, horror fantasy, and poetry. I also host two podcasts, Between the Pages Book Chat and Words That Kill. I have a book cover site for pre-mates and custom covers, uh, AF, AFS cover designs. I also have a red bubble shop, and this is my latest horror poetry book. Nice. Yeah. And that's that me. Great. Awesome. Welcome. All right. Mr. Lar. Hello. Uh, my name's Ron Lar. I write Fantasy, science fiction, humor. Here's the first book of my fantasy trilogy. Uh, I also have a humor science fiction novel coming out, hopefully in November. Uh, you get what you steal. Um, check it out on my website, which is nice. there. <laughs> nice. Welcome, sir. All right. And uh, welcome, Damien Tiller, to our, our midst here. Uh, it's Yay. nice to have you, sir. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Hi. So, my name's Damien Tiller. I'm the author of The Overfall Chronicles, um, a dark epic fantasy series um, that greatly gets darker the further it goes on throughout the, the books. So, thank you for having me. And I always point this out, as you may have noticed by the uh, slight twang to my accent, I'm dialing in from the UK. Ooh. Welcome. I love when we have 
where we represent. We've got Canada, we've got the UK, international. We've got, States, we've, we've got the southern United States, and we've got the West Coast here. So yeah, we're 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 reaching out. So I love it. Um, I also love writing in the dark. Well, not writing in the dark. I like writing <laughs> about the dark. But you know, writing in the dark's a little tougher. But um, I really there's something that always comes up when people ask me about you know how you come up with these things and how sick your mind works and all these other things and uh and it's not a magic trick per se but it's not i don't know about anybody else but it's not something that i really really think about all that much it doesn't affect me i can i can pretty much disassociate myself from what i write and I'm kind of curious if that's kind of how you all manage, you know, going into these dark places. Is it is do you really immerse yourself in that or is it something you can disconnect and disassociate with pretty easily? Oh, I'll start both. Basically, it depends. I mean, it's not real. I mean, I uh, I have friends who can't watch horror movies because they get their panties on a wad and they lose their mind. No, to me, it's not real. And I enjoy it for the practical effects and I enjoy it for the storytelling. So yes, I kind of disconnect myself a little bit. However, I have written dark stories that I was very glad to be done with, mainly because I was really tired of being in that mindset. Uh, a story I wrote called Stone Baby, which is a triptych, a Southern Gothic triptych. And I got, it was just a very oh, heavy and sad and just a place of madness because, you know, Southern Gothic. But I was very, very, very glad to be done with it so that I could, then I, after that, I did something just fun because I needed to basically have a palate cleanser. But I never ever fall so much in victim to, I, I never get so much inside of it that I lose my mind and I forget that it's not real because it's not real. None of it's real. If it was real, it would be any fun at all. So <laughs> that's why I do this. If I want, I once had an acting teacher tell me many, many years ago, reality has no business in the theater. No one spends 30 bucks to have reality pushed in their face. They want escapism. They want fun. They want fantasy. And that's what I think stories are too. Stories, yes, yes. Okay, we are kind of the bridge between logos and mythos. That's true. And yes, there is some truth in all story. But in the end, especially when we're dealing with monsters, we are dealing with um, it's not real. No one's really being hurt. I've never, I don't, yeah, no one's really being hurt. Nice. It felt uh, like you were about to say I've never murdered anybody, but then you stopped. <laughs> I always stop before was, I actually incriminate myself. I'm not yeah, it was a little stupid, scary. Ron. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> what were you going to say, Anita? I say um, I just channel my inner villain when I'm writing, so that's that's how I do it. It's just like um, I'm one of the, the babies when it comes to, to watching and reading horror. Um, cause that stuff freaks me out. But, um, for the most part, I mean, I can watch some of it, but, um, the true crime stuff, like the, the actual reality stuff that fascinates me. So I just take all that fascination with the, the dark side of human nature and channel it into the, into the writing. And like I said, I get in touch with my inner villain and when I'm done, my inner villain goes away. So, yeah. Do you ever worry about being soiled by your inner villain? I mean, many actors talk about playing. Oh, no, very... I, I enjoy my inner villain. We get along fine. I guess it's a difference between writing and acting. Because when acting, you're actually having to, like, Benedict Cumberbatch once, once played a pedophile where he has to rape this small child. And he talked about having to go into therapy afterwards. It mm. really yeah. messed him up. Yeah, because um, also I'm, raping. I'm, I don't, I'm not big on sex crimes. Uh, I'll yeah. murder not, night and day. No problem. We start dealing with, like, like, uh, different uh true crime dealing with like like the murder of funko in japan i don't mm, no i don't i never, I never want to have to go into that story ever again so yeah i just wondered hmm. but when you're acting you are the the character you are the person and you're doing you're things. writing you're not the character you're just writing about yeah. the character so it's different even when you're in first person it's like someone else it's like physical memory. their story a physical memory versus just writing writing that's interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting idea to think about. I don't know yeah, if you've I ever think, uh, it. Sorry, Joe. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Damien. I, I don't know if you've ever found as you're, you're writing sometimes, you feel almost a little bit helpless when you've got something 
going on. You you mentioned about the sex crimes in in one of the the stories. There is a um, an aspect of that in one of my stories, and you almost feel helpless as it's happening. You you're seeing it happening and you're recording what's happening, but you're you're a little bit as you say you're a bit detached. And you're not actually involved in it, but you also feel that you you're not doing anything to um, to step in. Really, I guess I don't know yeah. if anyone writes in the same way. You have to flavor your story with this sex crime. And I'm so sorry, but you have, you're have you the victim of this particular story. Uh, Neil Gaiman talked about that, about how if he has, he has a nightmare of dying and having to be come face to face with all the characters he's killed and, and have to explain to them why, yeah, why you had to die. Well, you had to die for the sake of the story. Well, is that enough? Truly? I was simply created to be tortured and, and murder. Yeah, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but it's interesting. Okay. I derailed it enough. You can do something else now because I always <laughs> derail it. I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Right. Well, what do you think, Ron? Where, where are you at with all this? Uh, well, I mean, I tend to have the stories pretty well developed before I, I start typing um, mm -hmm. or putting pen to paper. So as I'm writing, it's like, hey, this is just what happened. I'm just, I'm just putting it down. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't feel yeah i don't get caught up but i mean so you're an i have i have I, I am i am and and just thinking about the story telling it to myself over and over and then but i did write a uh a, a chapter where a child was assassinated or murdered and and i was affected and and my wife's like well why did you write it then i'm like there was nothing i could do you know exactly. <laughs> that's what happened you know what i mean yeah. sorry my husband I mean, came in on me and I was crying, just big, blubbly, snotty crying. And he was all like, what? And I had to try to explain to him that I just wrote a really sad scene. And he's just mm. like, well, why did you write that? <sighs> Muggle. <laughs> it had to be yeah. for the story. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Karina, Karina chimed in here. She said, I had hundreds of horror videos back in the day, a huge horror fan. But when I became <laughs> a mother, I gained fear and haven't been able to watch them since. So. Hmm. Yeah, I think it is a part of where you are in your life too, right? I mean, uh, but as writers, we tend to tell the stories that are in our head. So wherever you are at that time in your life, the story is going to be in there, and you and you put it down, whether it is whether it is something that's traumatic or not. You just feel like it would be probably more traumatic to carry that weight. I think, right? Oh yeah, I think writing can be a form of therapy. It's a way, I have a theory that all writers are either killing or saving someone over and over and over again. And the question is, of course, you have to ask yourself, who are you killing and who are you saving? Mm. Nice. I like that. Are we supposed to answer right now? No, I'm don't. killing my <laughs> biological father. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I must have a lot of anger issues then. Oh, I have so much anger. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't save a lot of people. <laughs> <Just say it. laughs> I do actually. I I'm, I'm very bourgeois. I like my I like to save people. I like to try to save people in the end. But yeah, I uh, I once had an, a writing teacher in college tell me everything you write has a thread of anger. Even if you write about kittens, they would be very angry kittens. And it's true. I, everything I write has a little. Uh, it's okay. I'm going to therapy soon. Does that does that does that feed the darkness though for, for your stories? Do you think that layers the darkness a bit having that I, anger? I think so because I, it's a way for me to um, maybe uh, excise the anger or you know express the anger, get it out. Because anger inside, anger inward is one of the causes of depression. Anger inward is and um, all it does is end up becoming a tumor and giving you cancer and dying. So get it out. Women tend to take anger and bring it in. Men tend to take anger and kill everyone around them. Um, so women tended not to do that. So we have to, that's all we have to learn to express our anger in other ways than poisoning. So not that note I have. To, note to self, if, if you meet, uh, meet Nikki, don't take a cup from her. Would you like some tea? <laughs> no. <laughs> I actually have two characters that murdered by poison tea. So yes. Yeah. Oh, it's the go. way to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I used to have yeah. wolfbane and stuff in my garden, that old poison garden, <laughs> just for funds, just as if I could do it. And yeah. Where are you at, Damien? Do you do you kill a lot of your characters? Are you somebody that uh, has to wrestle with that a lot? I do, I do have people, um, characters that die throughout. And it's, as you say, it's 
it's a little bit um, lethargic and a little bit of, of kind of counseling on guess for yourself and things that we've all been through and seen and, and other stuff like that. Um, I had one fan who said basically anytime he he gets to love one of my characters, he's always scared to to, to love them because he never knows if they're going to make it to the end of the book or not. So it's a, yeah, it is a, <laughs> a, a bit more, yeah. more carrying. Yes. Nice. Karina says you don't have to go to a dark place to get where you needs to go. You just need to be able to step back and walk away. Sometimes that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you do carry it. You know, it's mm. oh, there we go. Cat cat sighting. <laughs> Yay! It's cat official, sighting. It's official show now. Now we know it's an official show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the weird thing but, is, yeah. he didn't used ahead, to do man. it, and now he always does it. <laughs> Sorry. It's not a show without a cat, but not yeah. a show. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I mean, to Karina's point, I think um, I don't know how long how long does something like that last? Uh, you know, I've I've had mo I've had a moment or two like that, but I can kind of let it linger for a little bit. But I usually, you know, I can turn on Netflix or listen to some music and get it out of me pretty fast. I think. But, me too. Yeah. Well, I just do something else. Uh, I'm very. I'm very good at compartmentalization. Yeah. And I just uh, put it in a box and put it aside and go on to the next thing. So, yeah. Hello, Margaret. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for smashing the like button. <laughs> Smash the like. So, I just locked all anger. my feelings away. <laughs> put it in, it's in the vault. I can't write this morning, so I'm going to smash the like button instead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So when did you guys start liking horror, or when did you guys start playing with dark stuff? I mean, I mean, I I've always, I was that, I was that kid. I was, I was uh, very young as well. My my first horror movie I watched, I was probably no more than four or five years old, and it was Nightmare on Elm Street. That my, oh my god, you were a young little thing, Frieda, aren't you? And yeah, so that was <laughs> that was the beginning of that path into to enjoying that type of thing, and probably not enjoying it in the same way as I do as an adult, but uh, yeah, definitely enjoying the the darker parts of it. I was seven years old at school and trying to check out a book about bats. And they said, well, you have to, well, this is too old for you. You have to prove that you can read bats. So I had to, I read because I was a gifted youth. And they were like, oh, well, you're so smart, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. I wanted the book on bats because I believed bats turned into people because I had seen it in a movie. And I wanted to know how to do that, how to become a bat to turn into a person. And at that point in time, I still believe books held the secrets to everything and the answers to all the secrets. I still, and I still do, I still see books as a magical thing. Um, but as a kid, oh my God, I was, I was that kid. I was the kid who dressed up as Elizabeth Bathory when I was like 10 to go to, to, go to school to the Halloween party at school. It's amazing I ever dated. Um, it's I was that kid. I had I ran a, I had a monster hunting club in my fifth grade class, um, and stuff like that. Um, I was that kid. I, I always I was the kid who was always in the library at the occult section, which was just mythology and stuff. But I was all into it, man. Oh man, the Bell Witch, all the things. I was I was that kid. So yeah, I'm, I was doomed. <laughs> From a very very young age. Mm. Yeah, how about for everybody else? Well, I grew up reading murder mysteries, so that's where the killing part comes in, and um, the other part comes in with my fascination with myth mythology and and mm -hmm. and Gr the original Grimm's fairy tales with yes. all the with all the witches and the cannibalism and the murder, not the so Disneyfied versions, no. So I think that's where it started. But I got started in horror writing by accident because I was—I had to write this very nice story for a writing group. Hated every minute of it. <laughs> Sorry. So um, no, uh, the story turned out fine, but I hated every minute of it because it's so sweet and nice. And no, no, no. And so my muse went away. So I wrote a story about Jack the Ripper and to bring it back, and that's how I got started. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the muse is very, very picky. Uh, I was working on a story, and everything set up. Everything was great, and then it just fizzled, just fizzled. And I'm like, why? I don't know why. I thought maybe it was the depression or whatever. And then one day I started thinking, and it hit me. Oh, the reason the muse is like, no, no, thank you. I'm out. It was because I had placed it in too nice a place. It needs to be in a much 
darker place because I was placing it in things in my childhood. And I was like, no, no, that, that was a really good time in my childhood. That's no, no, that's not, that's not, that's not mess that up. Let's go and really do into this part of your childhood. Oh yeah. There's some dark ink here, baby. Let's use this one. And uh, then the muse is finally back. So I'm, I'm back to working on that story, but yeah, my muse, uh, if I don't listen to her, she pretty much goes bye, girl. I got things to do and leaves. So Karina says my first horror film was Salem's Lot. It freaked me out so bad. I've never d d gone to bed yes. with the windows open. So. <laughs> this is the television. The television series was it's a little kid. They went, let me in, let me in. Oh, yes. That freaks says, me oh, out. Oh, my God, I hate clowns. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, and it, well, for me, I think one of the scariest things for me was Twilight Zone as a child, watching Talking Tina and mm. watch Talking Tina messed me up. I can't handle dolls. No, never can. I don't like dolls. Uh, I then don't, you can tell my little guy back there, the little Zulu warrior, the doll thing, that show messed me up. So when I happen, I happen to tell my husband, right there my in the deepest, right corner, yeah, that little guy, that, 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 <laughs> I happened to mention to my husband one day about my deepest, darkest childhood fear. He's like, oh, really? And so for our anniversary that year, he bought me that <laughs> because that's why we've been married for 30 something years because and, and when for a while there we would our game was to hide at places so you'd find it like behind the toilet you'd find it in the pantry coming at you so you had um, zulu on the shelf not elf on the shelf oh my god we do oh <laughs> we will do that this year for christmas i, I hate maybe, elf maybe, on the shelf. maybe you should wish out. upon it when you see it the next time wherever it is yes Oof. i've murdered elf on the shelf a couple of times in my story nice. <laughs> yeah the, the 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 whole brigade of elf on the shelf in my um reindeer solution got wiped out so oh, God, awesome. the, it's the north pole wars the story oh, so, okay. in case you're wondering <laughs> nice well That's awesome. my first one was jaws i was a little <gasps> kid and it had Love just jaws. come out on hbo so this is when the movie came out you know yes. and uh i was very young and it was terrifying which i enjoyed very much although now when i snorkel and the other snorkelers are like, look, a shark. And everybody swims over towards the shark. I no. go the other way. Hell yeah, because yeah. you're smart. Yeah, but, well, they're not like giant sharks, but I don't care. I don't care. Shark, shark. Once I hear a shark, I'm like, I'm out. I'm over here. I'm, Jaws I'm heading back is to the a boat. brilliant so movie. You got, you got introduced to a psychological aspect of horror, which I think uh, that's where I, I was going to go there next, which yes. is the idea. So for me, like movies like Nightmare on Elm Street and Creepshow, I always found those more funny than I did. They're fun. If it, horror, horrific, even at a young age, but then I got introduced to Edgar Allan Poe and got deeper into like like the darkness of Shakespeare when Shakespeare gets really dark and and all of those things kind of turned turned like it was like a light bulb came off in my head and I go oh yeah you could get you could get really really dark with psychological aspects and I wrote a short story about uh, being stuck in a coffin being yeah. alive and stuck in a coffin and that. And I was like, okay, I'm off and running from that point forward. And it's like, I really, really dig the psychological things. And a lot of those crime shows you're talking about, I need to have a lot of that aspect in it too, you know, where there's a lot of figuring out what's in their brain and why they do the things they do. Because well, you know, dealing with serial killers or sadistic killers or all the different kind of killers. That's fascinating. What made them do that? Mm -hmm. um, and most of the times you can be broke down to ser uh, several things. Sometimes not. Like Canada, the uh, Ken and Barbie killers. Ka what's her name? Car uh, Carla, Carl Hamonka and Paul, Bernardo. whatever his name was. Those two. Do you Paul remember? Bernardo. Yes. Oh, my God. The last podcast and left just did a three episode series on them. And I knew a little bit about the case, but oh my God. And it gets me about them. What scares me about them is that they, there was, there was no trauma in their past. There was no brain injury. These people just really like to torture and rape young girls. Mm. What Canada. The Canada. So I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't talk US. Oh, I'm just saying. You know, we have, we have the, yeah, we I can go to the 1970s and get way worse. So worse. But that's called the mm. lead. The lead. I think water. we should, I think we should all just pile on Damien with the Jack the Ripper and just say, you know, damn oh UK. Oh, no, man. <laughs> England has some yeah, good, good stuff. stuff. He only had, as famous as he is, he only had a, a, a small handful of kills, really. He didn't compare to some of the kind of the great US serial killers that are in the. Yeah. 
triple True. digits of fixed yeah, right. right. <clears throat> You still Russia, started it. I think Russia has the, <laughs> the most per capita serial kill. I mean, um, per victim serial because they, they've had some really prolific ones in Russia. Wow. Oh, They're Russia. so competitive. So or so, yeah. <laughs> well, also because they don't want to accept they have. Same thing as North Korea. And yeah, yeah, they don't want to accept the fact that they have crime. We don't mm. have crime. Um, so yeah, we don't have COVID either. Yeah, yeah but there, there's a there's a site on the on the internet I was looking through that was that lists the serial killers by country by kills and yeah, Ooh. the world is very dangerous. <laughs> this is why aliens don't like us and we'll never get in the Federation ever because we're just really angry war apes. That's all we are. I'm, I'm, <sighs> so I'm curious if there's a if, you know in, in when you start to do research and get deeper into the dark elements of what you're writing has it ever gotten so dark for you that you turned away from it have you not written something or had started something and you just say oh this is too dark i think i don't want to put this out has anybody I a, experienced that experience, actually the book that i'm working on at the moment the fifth book that i started on it's based in a, a prison so the um the Blankler monks are, are a religious order within my my fantasy series and there's a prison underneath one of their monasteries and while re researching that i started to reach out to actual ex-convicts to hear their true stories and, and get a feel for that, um, that world. And one of the people that I was interviewing to get that concept was a, a convicted murderer. And just talking to him and getting his story, it became quite hard to hear. And just the, the really blasé, the way he was talking about it and going into some of the details and, and things like that. I, I made it through that session, but once I'd finished the, the session with him and kind of sat back and was looking back through my notes, it was really heavy because it wasn't just a story at that point it was something that actually happened it was someone's life that was that was snuffed out and it kind of derailed my story for a little bit it took me a couple of weeks to, to digest that and actually get over what i'd heard yeah that's like secondary trauma yeah that's what that's called secondary trauma yeah oh my husband was <clears throat> excuse me he was in the military for 23 years and He's never told me about his experiences and the many things he's done. And uh, one day I happened to be sitting outside with him and his buds. And I guess they forgot I was there. And they started talking about things. And I started kind of like going, this is why you're all on medication. Because I write about this stuff. I research this stuff. But I've never had to smell it. I've never had to hold someone as they died. I've never had to pull someone out and watch their body come apart. I've never had to do these things. To me, it's all still a little bit over here. I'm still a little bit away from it. But for people and then listen to people actually talk about the experiences, it's a lot more humbling because I, know, I feel almost a, a, a responsibility to make it more, um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Authentic. Gentle. Yeah, you know, authentic, okay. but also be gentle to understand. I had a, I once oh, I ran this writer's group once where he was, this guy was going to write about a sniper and the sniper always had to see red before he did his kill. Mm. And I'm like, my husband is a sniper. Would you like to talk to him about what it's like being a sniper? I mean, just to give some, no, because it, it upset, it, he, you know, it didn't fit into his story. He mm. wanted this psychopathic guy who just seemed to like to kill people from a far away. And I'm like, okay, but I'm just letting you know, you want to talk to an actual person who's done it and who's a sniper who has those experiences? Yeah, sensitivity, you know, sensitivity, sensitivity readers. You, you need to really, um, because that's someone's life you're dealing with. For sure. And you're representing a certain person and you're, you're basically making them, you're stereotyping them or you're, you're stereotyping them into being a psychopath. Yeah. And which is, not I've, the case. Yeah, I spent decades living amongst Marines and I gotta let you know, I have never met a veteran who wants to go to war. Yeah. Not one. Every veteran I've ever met who's been in war said they'll do whatever they possibly can. So their sons, their daughters won't have to go do that. They don't yeah. want it. And anyone who tells you they want war has never been in one. Yeah, so, I stood on a, I stood on a, I stood on a flight deck waiting for um, a ship to come in to go to Haiti. That was the closest I came in. And boy, you could you could smell the nervousness. I mean, it was just palpable. It was fear, just yeah. in the air. It was just like people were really frightened, you know, well, hearing yeah. about how uh, guys are running through the streets, letting bombs off, and just it's just civil war out there. And it's like you don't know how to deal with that until you're in it. And 
even then it stays with you forever. And it's just it's yep. super hard. I had a friend go down to Somalia during the whole Somalia aid thing back in the 90s. And he went there thinking, yes, we're going to go do good things. We're going to go do good things. We're going to save these people, yada, yada. He came back, fuck them. Fuck them all. Mm -mm, no. Because whenever we try to help someone, they try to kill us. Yeah. I was like, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because, yeah, I'm sorry. Done. Done. But I also had a friend who did two tours in Vietnam. And he would never tell me about his experiences. He kept saying, Nick, you won't understand. You don't get it. You're a civilian. You always will be a civilian. No matter what I tell you, you won't understand. And I think that's true. I mean, I write about you know, zombie chickens and voodoo and just weird stuff. I mean, I, my stuff's magical realism. It's, you know, it's not real. But I you still you, you still do a lot of research. For I do a lot do. of research. It's amazing for the weird, stupid shit that I write. I do a lot of research. Um, I've got books and books and books about weird stuff, mm -hmm. especially when I'm writing about a culture I don't understand. I, I'm not a part of. Like I don't know anything about New Orleans, so I had to go deep dive into New Orleans and into all that. Uh, I do. I do a lot of research for really silly stories. I mean, none of these stories are ever going to change with the world. And that's fine with me. As long as I entertain you. That my job is to entertain you. So. I'm I'm curious. I'm curious if I need if you know, with the amount of research that you do, because you you said a lot of stories in ages and, and, and you said mythology is was always something you're were interested in. Did you find a lot more darkness than you expected in, in, in researching those kind of things? Well, I found a lot of darkness. I'm not sure if I, I didn't expect it or not, because I mean, <laughs> I always had a fascination with history. So I know how dark history has been. And, you know, we haven't come up that far, frankly. We're not. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we've come some some way, but yeah, it's a long way to go. So, I mean, it's not it's the it's the the perception of history that i found, found unexpected is mm. that the the that you're taught it one way but when you actually go in and you research it you find out that it's not the way you've been taught in high school at all never and there's a lot more layers a lot more subtlety and the psychologicalness of it um uh that that you find when you, you research which is which i found interesting and fascinating i've never actually come across anything that that it's kind of repulsed me for lack of a better word mm -hmm. but you know it's not something that i would go out and do anytime <laughs> soon because it's just some well, of that stuff they, that they did was horrible they say history is written by the victor so it's always one side in one perspective really unless you really dig into it to get both sides of the conflict or yeah to understand because Everyone sees himself as a hero in any situation. Exactly. It doesn't matter which side of the, the fight you're in, really. That's something I always remember. Yeah, the villain thinks they're the hero always. It depends on who wins, is who gets to be the villain. Well, that's how you layer a villain, right? You, you, yes. you you're basically telling their story in the way that they see it as the hero. You know? Exactly. I mean, that's why, like the Avengers movies, Team yeah. Thanos. Thanos yeah. had a pretty good argument i mean i just don't like the idea of having to kill half the universe but it's a pretty good argument and it's not a new argument it's a very old economical uh who's who's the guy who did it shit can't think of his name he was an econ economist back in the 1800s who said that he said very thing we need to kill off 50 percent of the human race or we're gonna out we're gonna outlive this planet so, I don't know who that who said that. Uh, but it's, something I've heard with that a, it's something with an A. It'll hit me in the middle of the night. I'll scream it. My husband will think I'm having an affair. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. The, but the only trouble with Thanos' argument is that it's not a permanent solution. At best, it's only temporary. Yeah. Because maybe he eventually the would... world or the universe or whatever will repopulate itself and you'll have the same problem all oh. over again. You kind of hope the, people would learn not to keep making the babies. You can't feed. You can't take care of. Don't make it the babies. I think. I think so, also the problem with his argument is he has no control over who who is destined who to die. Or dest you know, and that's, yeah, I know. That's what Spider ultimately. That's ultimately what sinks him is the idea that he did this act and yet nothing changed. It didn't feel like there was something that he he accomplished by doing it. You know. He felt okay, but he went back to his little farm in the middle of nowhere and just kind of like and was miserable. Good. 
in, I, mean, in, I thought he was nothing. I hit the, I don't like. I don't think he liked the idea. Well, of in the movies, in, in the movies, they don't represent him very well. But in the comics, he was miserable. Okay, see, I'm only on the only on the movies. So in the movies, he looked he looked pretty happy. But here's a really cool back to the darkness aspect. A lot of the different stories and stuff that's come up of the of the time during the blimp during the the this. The people who had to live without, and then suddenly, boom, those people are back. Can you imagine? You've been gone for right. how many years? Three years? And your family has gone on. You come back, and your wife is married to someone else, and she's pregnant by someone else. Now what do you do? Yeah. What do you do for a job? Your your business has gone on. They've, they've done other things. Your children have grown up. What if you blipped out when you were 13? You come back. All of your friends are out of high school, in college now. You've got to do high school all over again. It's a fascinating, I love what they've done with this because it's a very interesting idea to think about. And that's what we're all for. I mean, writers are all about ideas. We're a Pol we're a Apollonian. We love ideas. Give me ideas to play with. That's that's my drink and meat. Mm -hmm. So and, and the darker the better, quite frankly, because I find happiness and brightness and rabbits and bunnies very boring. <laughs> Unless it's a vampire bunny. Unless it's a vampire bunny. <laughs> then that gets interesting. <laughs> fair there enough. There has Bunicula. I never read it, but I know there's a yeah. vampire bunny, Bunicula. Yeah. Mm. Uh, have, a, have a free run. Is, is your research, you know, when you when you look at your research, do you kind of, have you ever, you know, I mean, you're doing a fantasy series, so, I mean, but it's rooted in myth too, isn't is it not? Uh, ugh. well, I am, I mean, I do do some research and for one of the, my upcoming books, I'm doing a lot of research and it's not, it's in subjects, but you know, I just drink a lot. I don't know about the rest of the office. <laughs> That's how I yes, deal with things. Mom's got Alzheimer's. Said. Well, let's go to the liquor store. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just how I do. That's well. You medicate how you medicate. You and, you and Hemingway. <laughs> yeah, but look what happened to Hemingway. Yeah, well, there was if other things going If on this show weren't... Hemingway. So I'm on Pacific Standard Time, so this show starts at 9 in the morning for me. Otherwise, oh, no. okay. I'd have a drink while we were while we were doing the show. Y'all think this is but... tea, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I did. It is tea, mostly. Um so <laughs> i have to i have to admit i am i'm also on pacific time and i i drank a little too much last night and i was a little hungover this morning and i i actually did think about hair of the dog a little bit but oh yeah you know i never do I a figured, panel sober <laughs> you insane who does a panel sober so <laughs> Where where Damien is, it's a good streaking time. So it is. It'll be after this call though. I'm waiting. I'm actually one of the weirdos that does do it sober. Have a drink afterwards to calm the nerves once it's all been and done. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I need it before so I can. It depends on what I drink. Whiskey makes me more talkative. Wine just puts me to sleep. Mm -hmm. So That's my um, I drink. If I drink too much, I'll be sitting here kind of like by the end of it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But just a little splash of whiskey in your tea or your coffee or whatever. Just. Or before a panel, you know, a just really. I love that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. You go to a con, you're working a con. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a flask underneath that debt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be there for ten hours having to deal with all these people. Hell yeah. So. I must admit, I did the first ever book signing I did. It was it started like eight nine in the morning, but yeah, I had a, a cask of wine. I was having a couple before people came in because again the apprehension and. Just knowing yes. that this trail of people that you have to be upbeat and talkative and Whew. it takes a lot out of you. You got to put on the face. Exactly. And um, it is exhausting. So Speaking of acting, huh? <laughs> oh, uh, no, no. Look, I'm really lucky in that I've got a theater background because I can act. I just simply yeah. put on the face. But I do have friends who are brilliant writers and their stories are so good. But when we go to cons or whatever, they just sit there. Yeah. And no one comes to them because they don't put out the vibes. And I'll have to direct the people, check out this guy's book. It's really good, blankety blank blank. And then he just sits there and goes, Yeah, here it is. <laughs> Damn it. You gotta ooh, you gotta put make up a persona. Make one up. That's what I do. I fake it all the time. That's my superpower. Nice. What persona do you need today? Mm -hmm. What kind of face do I need to do? So again, 
therapy, lots of therapy. I'm going to be figuring that out. <laughs> well, uh, something that has been figured out is what segue. books. Segue. Yeah. Okay. No, <laughs> you, did, you did good. Did, I did, gave you a segue. Yeah. What has been figured out is um, a really uh, great indie connection this week. If you're a fan of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, See how Cannon's got your back. Here you go. CL Cannon here from Fiction Atlas Press, bring you another Indie Connection. And in honor of Halloween, we are going to be doing books that you might enjoy if you're a fan of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The first book I have for you is called Shade by Marie de Stofano. A dangerous holiday, a deadly curse brought to life. When Mary Wollstonecroft Goodwin accepted an invitation to Lord Byron's house party deep in the Swiss Alps, she hoped it would serve as a welcome distraction from her broken heart. Instead, she finds herself surrounded by enigmatic guests with her own dangerous secrets to hide. From the moment of her arrival, the party is more than it seems, as Mary and the others are strictly forbidden from leaving the villa after dark. But tales of feral beasts aren't the only rumors whispering through the halls. Dr. John Polduri, a handsome and mysterious party guest, fervently pursues local legends that the dead can rise, ruled by their own barbaric king. When the group plays a game of storytelling to pass the time, they weave together tales of nightmarish ghouls and horrible villains inspired by the myths. And Neri soon realizes their harmless stories have the power to conjure. Twisted creatures will come to call. The dead will stalk the villa, and the royal master will stop at nothing to claim Mary as his own. The second book I have for you is called Teen Frankenstein by Chandler Baker. It was a dark and stormy night when Tor Frankenstein accidentally hits someone with her car and kills him, but all is not lost. Tor, being the scientific genius she is, brings him back to life. Thus begins a twisty turny take on a familiar tale set in the town of Hollow Pines, Texas, where high school is truly horrifying. The third book I have for you is called Monster Born by Chris Austin Radcliffe. What happens when a man starts life as a corpse? Two hundred years ago, Frank Victorson awoke as a semi-dead, monstrous abomination reanimated by his hubris-ridden father, Victor Frankenstein. But Frank refused to become the infernal hate his father spewed at the world. He walked away from his origins and into a small Minnesota town overflowing with magic. Now Dr. Frankenstein's other sins want revenge. The Nordic elves of Frank's new home call him family. The werewolves call him friend. And when the town's vampires disappear and innocents die, Frank realizes the demon responsible might be the one force on earth faster and stronger than him and the one foe capable of pulling to the surface his long-suppressed rage. Now Frank must stop a rampaging evil bent on murdering the people he loves the most. But can he save his town without losing himself to the monster he once tamed? And the last book I have for you is called The Prometheus Collector by Joshua Dyer. No one wants to be fooled, but that's what Frankenstein did to you all. Victor's words were the mere ravings of a coward and madman. The truth is a fickle mistress. I was the one that raided the graveyards and robbed the dead of their terrestrial remains. It was I who pursued your creation across continents when you hadn't the spine to see it to it yourself. It was I who held my begotten son in my hands that day. Frankenstein took the glory, took the fame, and hoarded the money from our misfortunes. The time for my retribution has come. Okay, that's all for me this week. I'll see you next week on The Indie Connection. Bye. Go check those books out, everybody, and, and, and to get some nice horror-themed books for your day today and Halloween. And uh, uh, thanks again, as always, to CL Cannon. The, book, the links are in the, in the description, so check those out. And uh, we're, we're back to, to talk a little bit more for a little bit. Uh, you know, I was curious in, in talking about research, too. The idea of research is to layer your story, to lend authenticity, to kind of get, um, you know, a background for your characters and your stories and your settings and all those things.
but we rarely use a lot of what we find in that in 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 use in telling the stories and telling the characters we may layer it so that people don't see what we've used but we also it's, it, it's probably 10 percent, 15 percent, if it, maybe even less than that if you that, that you discover and i'm i'm kind of curious if uh, you know in in doing that in the dark aspect of it is there a lot more that you hide in, in when you're doing a darker story or is it more is it more that is there more that you use because you want to you want to create kind of that atmosphere you want to create so if you're if you're finding darker research i would think that maybe you might use it a little bit more am i mistaken in that idea or has that come across for anybody else in that respect I I personally t tend to not use too much of it in the actual stories. I like the, the reader to be able to interpret their own way. I th think if you if you layer too much of that research in, it becomes a, almost a research paper in itself, whereas you use that to, to build the realism, to build the background and to, to make it believable and actually have some some founding behind it, but then not to, to dilute it to a level that the reader can't in infer their own um, emotions and their own darkness inside themselves into the writing. Exactly. Like, for instance, I never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And I will uh, look for fodder, like, for instance, my Jack Hitchin Hedgy stories. I I have a really great book. It's all about slave tales from uh, South Carolina and North Carolina as the Gullah Gullahs. And fascinating. So what I did was I went through, I would highlight the things I want to use. And there was this one particular thing in it called a Boo Daddy. And a Boo Daddy in the legends is basically like a, a monster, a boogeyman. Yeah. But in my story, I created the Boo Daddy to be a protector elemental spirit that I use in further down, like in the end, the very last story, it becomes, again, it comes back and it's kind of the protector spirit. But it was a very big focal thing. And I just changed it to fit my story. Again, I never let the truth get in the way of a good story. If I can possibly take that fodder and twist it to what I need it to be. That's what for me research is. It gives me fodder, it gives me more clay. I cannot build without bricks. It gives me the bricks to build my house. Yes. I take it yeah. one step further. I don't mm -hmm. let the truth get in the way of anything in any Ooh. aspect of my life. Are you a lawyer? So <laughs> Just a liar. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you, you were gonna say something in here? I was going to say, yeah, it's just when you, you, you do the research, you take what works for the story. I mean, you might do a lot of research for background information, but if there are things that work for the story, you take them. And if there are things that don't work for the story, you just leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's just like when you're researching history, it's you need to know what the stuff looked like, what they did, how they did it. But most of it doesn't end up in the story. Yeah. Do not bore your reader. That's no. so for flavor. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not bore thy God. Do not <laughs> bore your reader. And I find, it, I get bored. Uh, yeah. Tell me what I need to know. Let's move on with our lives. Like for instance, the story I'm writing right now, I needed to know what, what kind of mouse traps were used in Tudor England. And I'll be damned there's a lot of information on mouse traps through the ages. <laughs> I downloaded a 90-page thesis yeah. on it. And uh, I was like, fascinating. I can use this, but I'm not going to actually go into the history of it. I'm going to be able to say, yep, there is this thing over here that he captures my sin so he can do experiments on. Yeah, and my I'll, big I'll... rabbit my big rabbit hole was a 1970s uh, cash register. I, I did probably hours upon hours of research for a half a page of what the cash register was being used for. And it's like, oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You also yeah. got to use it and make sure it doesn't become a, a tool of procrastination because I do mm -hmm. love learning new stuff. And yeah, well, it can become a tool of procrastination. Well, let me give yeah. you an example of what I was talking about because when I first started my story, I, I had befriended an ex uh, LAPD robbery homicide detective and I sat down with him and talked. And the first thing he said to me was, you know, if you want to make this authentic, you have to decide what kind of killer your killer is and by that he meant is he a mass murderer is he a one-time killer is he a serial killer and that makes all the difference in the world on how he would approach how he was going to investigate it and everything like that and that 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 was like that was like gold that was like the nugget and that that set me on a path to be able to really get inside of what 
the direction of the psychological aspects of my, what my killer was going to be and do. And I think that really lent, lent itself to authenticity. Yeah, it's not completely the research that I used, but in having that one element, that one thought, mm. it changed everything for me. And so, you know, in that respect, that's why, you know, uh, that's what I was thinking about in if, if, it, if it was a cash register, I wouldn't have changed anything about that scene, because even if, it, if I found that the cash register didn't work in it. But because of the darkness element of, of what it, we were talking about, that changed the whole dynamic for me in writing. Hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, I'm sorry. No, go, go, go. I think that can be one of the, the important things as well. While you're researching, sometimes you could be having conversations with people and they could make almost a flippant comment to them, that, but that triggers a whole spark mm -hmm. in your brain and a whole new route that you hadn't even considered going down, like you were saying with the uh, the agent that, that gave you that little tidbit of information. It allowed you to look into a whole new way of writing that story that you may not have had if you hadn't done that in, uh, research and hadn't had those conversations and hadn't mm -hmm. met those, those different people that all build and contribute into your stories. True. Yeah. yeah, it's like I was doing research for my historical fantasy and I came across um, a bit of tidbit where, you know, that uh, uh, public dissections were a thing in Renaissance Europe. And it's like that fits perfectly in book two um, because one of the characters is this kind of sketchy doctor type. So I could have my character um, go to a public dissection to get to know this doctor. So that that little bit of research kind of changes a bit of the tone of the book as well. So, mm -hmm. it, yeah. Awesome. yeah. When I was reading Stone Baby, I contacted a guy. He's a pathologist. I have his book somewhere. Damn. He was really nice. And I asked him flat out, okay, here's the question. Um, can a woman stop labor? Can she go into labor and willingly stop it from happening? And he said, no, 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 no. Once labor starts, it just it happens. Uh, it doesn't work for my story. So no, it stops. So I don't care. Again, I don't worry about the truth. I keep going for the story. But that was interesting. Although I, I still argue with them on that because I've actually read stories about women who've gone into labor, the labor stopped and they thought, oh, well, I guess they thought they were miscarrying and they thought, oh, well, it's done now. And of course they had stone baby. You guys know what a stone baby is, right? I do. Yes. yes. So that's where stone babies come from. So yeah. Anyway, uh, he was really great, but I didn't listen to him because it didn't. Maybe, get maybe, story. maybe, maybe explain it for the audience, just in case people don't know. Stone for baby. Ron. <laughs> okay, a stone baby is okay. I imagine, was trying to cover you, Ron. I was trying to okay. cover you there. <laughs> a woman, uh, a woman is pregnant, and for whatever reason, the baby dies, and then the body just kind of like, it's kind of like uh, like a pearl. You know how a pearl is just a grain of sand that goes inside of a shell, a clam, and the clam will put around things around the pearl to keep it from irritating the insides. The body does the same thing. It calcifies the, the, the fetus, and the fetus becomes this calcified stone baby. And she can carry that baby for decades, or actually records of people carrying Holy mackerel. decades, until finally they start having a lot of pain, and they go to the hospital, and they're 80 years old, and they just thought, well, that was just a bump in my gut. I didn't know. And they cut it open, and it's just this calcified baby they've been carrying for decades and decades and it happens it's very rare but it does happen wow yeah i got the idea because having a really bad you don't want to hear so but yeah uh <laughs> so anyway it's a uh, it's a thing it happens you can google it you can see pictures you probably just inspired I... a few new authors to start their own dark stories this evening oh, hold on a second hold on a second. i don't think i'm gonna do that google it <laughs> see this is a. Uh... This is the cover for Stone Baby. This is the cover for Stone Baby. Uh, my daughter made that for me for my birthday one year. Um, so, what an odd family! Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> and it, and it leads it leads to another another segue. Oh, good. <laughs> See, I am weird. the best. <laughs> All right. We have a whole segment on Nikki's weird family. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, oh, I am. Um, it's, I'm glad to know, Damien, that you have killed a lot of folks in your stories because you're welcome to the club. You're one of us, and I appreciate that. One and, of us. And, I, and I'm, you know, one of us, one of one us. One of us, one of us. We lost <laughs> but, uh, Yeah. But, uh, 
<laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I know a couple people here uh, and I've heard their stories. Um, uh, Nikki tells a great story about how she killed a coworker once. Uh, mm -hmm. and you can go see that. I and mean, she can tell it here again if she wants to, but you can go see that in the mystery and uh, suspense uh, panel that we did uh, for genres. But I'm, you know, killing is like one of those things that I think we all relish a little bit. We all, you know, figure out that that's kind of the cool aspect of, of the darkness. Am I wrong in that? Is that kind of, I mean, we don't, I mean, there's characters we fall in love with and we don't want to kill and all that. But for the most part, when we kill somebody that's deserving to die, it's like, yes. Oh, okay, there it I is. Deserving to, to die. I get to write that, right? Oh. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there are some people that just need to be killed. Okay, yeah. that's just it. But, yeah, I don't always like killing. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, yeah, you wrestle with it, too. No. That's the other no. idea. Oh, well, I'm mostly like okay. killing. I, I've only met one character I didn't want to kill, and he's still dying. So, <laughs> oh, if they have to yeah. die, Beautiful. they have to die. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I have no problem killing my characters. I don't. Okay. I, I mean, I know a lot of authors say they have, yeah, they cry and they, yeah, no, I just stab them and they're dead and I go on. So. <laughs> okay, I'm scared of her now. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm quite glad there's a channel between us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ocean. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do, is that? Do you look forward to those moments when you get to write that stuff, though, Anita? Or is it? Just, oh yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like. Amen. It's like it's like writing writing to get to the end, right? We all. Yeah, it's like if yeah. if I'm in a boring part of my novel, I just Ugh. skip to the killing part. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. A little pick me up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's how, about for the, for, how about for everybody else? Is it a natural thing that happens within your writing process, or do you get right to it? I tend what? to go on the oh, sorry, Mon. No, after you. I say I tend to go on the journey with my characters, so it's it's not something I won't skip to the the, the murder scene or the death scene. I will just write as as the journey continues. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes I can be as impatient as the readers to to get the the protagonist or the the person that deserves that that. Um, Come up and I have to wait as, as everyone else does for that to happen. So it can be extra sweet when you do get to to finally write that bit and see see it play out. I'm much like you. I'm kind of a pantser plotter. I'm a kind of a hybrid. I have an idea of where I want to go, but it is so much fun just to let the story unfold. Of course, it can also put you into corners you can't get out of, but it is great when you do when something a scene just starts unfolding and one of my favorite Jake Ishanji stories, Golems, Goons, and Coldstone Bitches, the very last scene is, I didn't plan that. I was just writing it and it just kind of came and it just was natural. And when, you know, the, the main antagonist dies and basically puts a curse, she just laughs. She's laughing as she's cursing Jake, knowing what his now, his now curse is. Um, it's great, but it was really fun for me to experience along with the reader, along with Jake. That for me is just fun. Uh, yeah. But yes, there are some people that, yeah, I, I enjoy killing because they're just jerks. So. Well, what, were you, what were you going to say, Ron? Oh, uh, I, when I started writing fantasy, it was the days when nobody died. <laughs> None of the good guys <laughs> died in fantasy, and I didn't like that. So I, purposefully went into it with <clears throat> excuse me with the plan to kill off a lot of a lot of the the characters and it was supposed to be also uh you know it's a dangerous time and a, and a dangerous mission and and you know you expect people to die and uh but i found i very much enjoyed those scenes whether it's the um even if it's a, a good guy and and that somebody mm -hmm. loves mm -hmm. Jeez, man. Um, <laughs> I'm the star uh, dad. Yeah. Even if it's a good guy that I that I love and that I'm hoping the readers love, uh, I I don't know. Yeah, they're they're scenes I've thought a lot about before I uh -huh. get to them. So I tend to very much enjoy whether it's a you know, the reward is killing somebody who deserves it or just the experience of the the emotions of a good guy dying. I, I'm curious, you know, Nikki brought up the idea of writing yourself into a corner, which is uh, if, if, if the famous story by Hitchcock about how, you know, he killed Janet Lee in, in, in Psycho because, 
he was he was basically in a corner and he's like you know what i gotta do something here and and i'm gonna do something that's gonna shock people and offend people but i don't care it's not the story i want to tell i want to get to the story i want to tell so i'm gonna kill her off and just go forward and 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 that's kind of how that happened in writing yourself into a corner so when you're writing yourself into a corner do you find more killings happen or more darkness happens or do you feel like you have to backtrack and and kind of redo the corner basically. there's always the chandler method of bring somebody in with a gun <laughs> things yeah. get a thing okay things are boring you know what to do bring a dude in with a gun and mm -hmm. start killing or for me betrayal i had a friend contact me once i'm stuck i don't know what to do with this blah blah, blah. for me betrayal is good have someone that people have been have been trusting this entire time and turn him into a judas and that opens up a whole lot of lines. Of course, you'll have to go probably go back and put in some seeds so it makes sense. This guy's mm -hmm. now Judas, but you can do this because you're God. You can do these things. Yeah, yeah. Betrayal is 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 good to get out of corners. As is killing off characters and that you were that that we're going to survive, and then you decide no, no, they're going to die now. So <laughs> <laughs> they're going to die now because I can do it. Yeah, yeah. it's like well, I was working on my historical fantasy and one character I had planned for him to survive and leave Venice. But no, when I came to the scene, no, no, it's better if he dies, it's more impact. And I killed him off with a invisible assassin. And I realized this invisible assassin is perfect for book three, where I had planned to have an invisible assassin. So yeah. it worked well, out great. It's like in Star Wars, you know, George Lucas uh, planned for Obi-Wan Kenobi to live. Yeah. It's the very first first screenplay. He lived, and it was his wife who went, no, 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 you've got to have Luke needs stakes. He has no stakes yet. You kill Obi-Wan, he now has stakes. As for Psycho, have you ever read the book, Psycho? Yeah, I've read it's it. It's great. I read it recently, and I am, wow, that guy knew how to end a chapter. It was <laughs> so good. I was... I was really impressed. Again, as a, as a writer, I'm always reading as a writer. And oh, I was just impressed at the way this guy knew how to end chapters on such a... And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great book. It really is. So yeah. Norman Bates is even creepier in the book. Even creepier. I mean, I love the masturbation That's and possible. stuff. <laughs> well, that's because he doesn't masturbate in the movie, in the book. In the, in the movie, he's kind of cute. You know, he's kind of that little, yeah. well, I think the guy's cute. I mean, uh, Anthony, um, what's his face? That Perkins. dude. Yes, he was cute. He looked like a little, you know, like a little chipmunk. His little, his throat was always moving. He's just really cute. The dude in the book is not cute. He is creepy and awful. So if you ever get a chance to read the book, it's really good. Cool. I concur. <laughs> okay, I killed that conversation. And next, <laughs> I'm great at segues and killing conversations. So, well. We'll con let me continue it. Uh, so, Damien, how do you get out of your corners? So it's the, the mix of different things, I guess. One of the ones that really springs to mind is in Dragon's Blight, the, the first book. There's a scene that's that's going on, and it's a bit of a corner, and it's a, a critical moment. Mm -hmm. And then one of the key characters who, again, I planned, he was planned to, to let them survive, and he was going to be the, the protagonist, actually, across a series of books. But it just didn't work out that way. It wasn't the case that mm -hmm. I... I planned to kill him off to get out the corner or to keep moving. It was just the only thing that made sense in that situation was that that character didn't walk away from it. You wouldn't survive that situation, and he didn't. So I then just had to carry on going on that journey and seeing what happened next, who stepped in to, to fill that void and what, what happened. And that's how I carry on with it. I just carry on taking the, the journey and seeing where we go. I uh, I'm like... Like you nikki i'm kind of like in between now I'm a hybrid. lot more where i outline and i and i and i pants a lot as well and I, that's the part that i always find is beneficial as a pantser is being able to change on the dime you know i mean outliners can do it too but mm -hmm. but they go back and then there's some of them that are super crazy and go back and change the outline and then write the story yeah. on that and i'm like wow <laughs> i don't know how i I don't have the patience for that. I just want to get to the story and get get it over. I think with. some stories need to be outlined, like a really super yeah. detailed murder mystery, <laughs> like you know, Agatha Christie kind of thing. You got or write the whole thing and then go back in and put in your seeds. But I, I think little, key points need to be outlined a lot for yes, anything. Key point. Yeah, yeah, boom, boom, yeah. boom. Because um, yeah, I think some books do need it. A comedy definitely needs to be outlined because you've got to hurt. Comedy's hard. 
comedies, murder's easy, comedy's hard. You've got to hit all these certain areas and twist it in such ways. It's it's almost it's a really, really hard gig. Well, luckily we have an expert at comedy. I know. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's so funny, guys, really. <laughs> so. Do you uh, did you find that wrong? It was was it hard to write a book like like what you wrote? No, especially especially your self help book, your self help book. Oh god, <laughs> no, no, you're as, as stupid as you are. Fat. How to talk to women was very easy to write oh, because god. I'm so great at talking to women. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I mean you don't you don't get married more than once if you're not good at talking to women and tricking them into marrying you. So. <laughs> I feel very expert. Um, no, I, I mean, for me, it's harder to write something that doesn't have any humor in it because that's not how I see the world. Um, so sincerity is the toughest thing for me. Ooh. I'm, I'm curious. Right. If I ever send you an email and at the end it says, sincerely, Ron, you know, I don't mean any of it. <laughs> My, I love that. It's my rule. I'm, I'm curious from if, from a comedy perspective, how do you write yourself out of a corner? Is it is it tell a different joke? Oh, yeah. Is it is it uh, you know because well, killing somebody's not always funny. You know it could be. No, no. Uh, sometimes it's hilarious. No. <laughs> um, well, I mean, this is tough because yeah. I mean, there's that's such a broad question when in the in the goofy science fiction novel uh, you get you steel that's coming out mm -hmm. um it's a lot different than the fantasy world in the fantasy book it is a lot of uh, when i didn't know what was going to happen next then there was a fight um mm -hmm. but it that was also because they were being hunted by the bad guys so i mean it was that was a plausible thing to have happen mm -hmm. that that at any moment they could catch up to them in the in the in the Gibby steel it was different and as a matter of fact um i wrote it with a, a friend and we wrote it page by page alternating so i would write a page and then he would How get cool. that and he would have to write the page so talk about writing yourself into a corner we You're were not right. purposefully <laughs> trying to screw one another i mean we wanted the book to succeed you know we wanted it yes. to make sense but it it is i mean uh, talk about you know, you read the page and you're like, ooh, what am I going to do? Uh, I mean, it's it was by far the most blatant experience in that regard. Uh, mm. I mean, we designed it into the way we wrote the first, the, just the first draft. After that, we <laughs> we were more sane. But it was, <laughs> um, it was definitely not, there's a fight every time we got stuck. I mean, but really, it was a different thing every time. I mean, you know, science fiction or fantasy that you... You really can do anything. So. Yeah. Nice. We didn't have a go-to. You, you had your own game of telephone going, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite interesting. Yeah. Exactly. Korea, a complex scene. scene can get you out of any corner. Huh? I think that's probably how you do it most of the time. You, you create a conflict even, you know, or you, or you kill. You just kill. You know, or you die with a gun. Yeah. So. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's how it's done. And uh, this is how this is done. And I really appreciate everybody being here and doing this today. It was a lot of fun. And uh, so let's go around and tell everybody where they can catch more of you and, and your wonderful books where you kill a lot of people and get really dark. Uh, so we're going to go back the backwards this time. So, Damien, tell everybody where they can catch you at. Perfect. So the first thing I want to mention is A Winter's Child, the third um, of the Eggfield Chronicles, is coming out on audiobook in the next week or two. So that would be the, cool. the best way to catch it. Nice. Um, other than that, it's in all, all the normal places. So it's on ebook, on Amazon, Kobo, etc., um, paperback. Yeah, it's anywhere you can normally get a book. Just look for Eggfield Chronicles. Um, Dragon's Blight's the first one, and then you can follow the series through. Nice. Awesome. All right. Thank you for being here, by the way, Damien. Thank you. No, Appreciate thank you for having me. It's always I always enjoy these type of things. So thank you for having me here. Yeah, we hope to see more of you later. Come back and see us again, and we would love to have you. All right, Ron, tell everybody where they can find you, sir. Uh, my website is the best place. I mean, uh, I'm exclusive to Amazon for my stuff, and but 
Cathaldi.com has links to, you know, my social media and the various books and news and signing up for my newsletter. I do a couple of newsletters, one for humor readers and one for the fantasy science fiction readers. And I put a lot of effort into content for those, probably way too much for the benefit I get, but, you know, my way to try and keep in, or to build relationships with the readers. So, and then if you don't go to my website, you can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Way to tie up the darkness, Evan Gill. I love it. <laughs> All right, Nikki, tell everybody where they oh, can find you. You can find me at my website down there. Uh, in nhbooks.com all my stuff is on Amazon all of it the latest thing I have out is the stone baby and other strange tales it's a bunch of small uh, short horror not horror stories uh, perverse muse Ed Bill and Poe stories a lot of fun my Jake Ishin Hedgy is like a pulp noir set in New Orleans 1930s you got voodoo you got golems and you got go go mm. you know, all kinds of fun stuff so you can find me there. Also, on my social media is on my website, as well as you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and all of that. I'm pretty much everywhere because I have absolutely no life. <laughs> and uh, this is going, you know, congratulations. You did find us. So stay a while and, and hang out with us. You know, we've got some great shows coming up. In fact, I have a really, really great show. Uh, Julia Allen is going to be back with In Progress tomorrow. Uh, and they're, they're going to be talking to L. Bachman and Sean Reed. Sean Reed is actually the audio producer of L. Bachman's book. Uh, I think it's uh, Maxwell Demon that he did the, and he's doing the second one as well. Uh, so he's the audio narrator. So uh, Julia is going to get really in depth talking to both of them about the process of working with the narrator and and talking about emotive writing. So. Uh, ch check that out tomorrow. That'll be 9 p.m. Eastern time for us. Oh, and no. it'll be a really great show. And I think it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, like I said, you know, smash that like button, comment, do everything that you can to support us. It, it really means a lot. And uh, where we're headed next, next weekend, we have, uh, we've been tasked to be a part of this. Uh, if I can do this properly of this every Come and check us out next weekend. I'll have a bunch of interviews with a bunch of filmmakers and actors and, and people involved with the films that you'll be seeing at the Hawaii International Film Festival. And also I will be doing reviews of some of the movies that we watched there uh, because during the month of November, my NaNoWriMo challenge is going to be, I'm going to be writing a blog, a review blog every single day in November. So I will publish one review every single day in November and write it on the spot that's going to be my nano rhymo challenge and i'm doing that for nano rhymo uh yes as always i'm a nano rhymo rebel i don't just write a novel during that time but um i'm real excited about trying that we'll see how long i can go uh hopefully i can do all 30 days but y y you know who knows uh, life life gets in the way sometimes but that's how it goes and that's my challenge and i'm gonna take it on so uh Call me out if you don't see it. All right, I uh, I, I need I need some motivation sometimes, and uh, I'll make sure that it happens. But uh, that being said, it's time for the final five minutes, and today Miss AF Stewart gets the honors, and uh, so um, we'll leave it with her and take it away, Anita. It's all yours. 
Hello. Um, I'm Anita Stewart, A.F. Stewart, um, and you can find me in my books on afstewart.ca and such books as the ones I'm going to spotlight now, Visions and Nightmares, Tragedy Spares No One and Takes No Prisoners, 10 Stories, 10 Women, Who Will Survive, Who Will Fall, Who Will Succumb to Their Inner Evil. Ooh. And this one, Chronicles of the Undead, Diaries of the Harrington Family. Three generations bound together under a horrifying family secret. Vampires exist. Inside the personal journals of the Harrington Family, watch a dark and dangerous odyssey unfold. Three members of this tormented family, Samuel, his son Edmund, and Edmund's daughter Charlotte must come to terms with evil. Set during the 18th and 19th centuries in London, England, the family must struggle against horror as their lives intersect with supernatural forces. As two intriguing vampires befriend, manipulate, and play with all three souls, altering their lives forever. And you can find those two books and many more on my website. And uh, also you can see this lovely new book, Poetry of Monsters and Madness. And I'm going to read you two poems from this book to end up the show. And we will start with, we will start with this one. <laughs> the Madness of Being. Scream with a thousand voices, reverberations of their apathy, pinpricks inside your purview of existential insanity. Gods of the void are calling. Shriek cascading shards of sound, glass falling into psychosis against the swallowing sea of forgotten secrets. Gods of the void are waiting. And this lovely poem is called Monsters. Under the moon, in the night shrouded woods, where even the bravest fear to go. Live the creatures cold, the beasts so dark, the ones that linger within the shadows. On Hallow's Eve they stir, on Hallow's Eve they roam. Lock your doors as they whisper at your keyholes, bar your windows as they knock at your panes. For underneath the moon the monsters dance, underneath the moon the monsters feed. Happy Halloween, and remember, it's always time to go indie now.